Now that we've introduced different types of systems which can oscillate or move back and forth in a regular and repeated way, such as pendulums and spring mass systems, we're going to talk about how we can graph up how position changes over time, velocity changes over time, acceleration changes over time, and eventually, at, by the end of the video, we're, we're going to talk about what happens to the energy or graphing how the energy changes over time. So we're specifically going to look at a vertical spring mass system that's oscillating about an equilibrium position and moving to some negative displacement and some positive maximum displacement. So on the left, I have in real time our vertical spring mass system that's oscillating back and forth. Um, and below that mass, I had a motion detector. And you can see how the position is changing over time and the velocity is changing over time. It should be clear to see that the shape of the position versus time graph and the velocity versus time graph is like a sine curve or a cosine curve. We're going to explain why they have that shape and how to, to go from the position versus time graph to the velocity versus time graph and acceleration versus time graph. Here it is again, but slowed down four times. So if you look at the position versus time graph above, you should be able to see how this mass goes from the lowest point position A through equilibrium to the highest point position C back and forth and back and forth. And what do you notice over time? on the position versus time graph or looking at the video on the left, that the amplitude remains about constant. It's being displaced positively some amount, if we look at the graph, by about 10 centimeters, and then it's going below the equilibrium position by about 10 centimeters. Here's just three seconds of the position versus time graph and the velocity versus time graph for us to look at and think about a little bit. So let's think about it. Um, at position A, this mass is all the way down here, and uh, it's got its largest negative displacement from equilibrium. Well, what's true of its velocity? Well, that's where the velocity is zero, where the mass slows down to rest and then speeds back up going towards equilibrium. At position B, going from A to B here, it speeds up to B and then slows down to C. And so at B, it's going to be passing through that equilibrium position. And if we look at the velocity versus time graph, that's when it has its maximum positive velocity. Once it goes from position B to position C, it's decreasing speed. And if we look at the precision time graph, remember, we know what's happening to the speed by what's happening to the slope of a position versus time graph. So from B to C, we can see that it starts out kind of steep, and then our position time graph gets less steep, and eventually up top here, the slope is zero. So at position C, we would expect the velocity of the mass to be zero. When we go from, when we go from position C back down to position B, we can see the slope gets a little negative, more negative, and it gets the steepest negative slope here. So at position B, it should have the largest negative velocity. That's our maximum negative velocity at that time. And if we go from position B to position A, we can see that we have our largest negative slope, and eventually that slope gets less steep, less steep, and the slope down here is basically zero. So when the object gets back up to position A, it's sorry, when the, when the object gets down to position A, its velocity again has to be zero. So we can see how the position versus time graph and the velocity time graphs are related to one another. Well, what about how the acceleration changes over time? So Again, I have our position versus time graph, our velocity versus time graph. We have the, a few times marked when it's going through the different positions. And on the bottom, you can see what the data looks like for our acceleration versus time graph. Again, it kind of looks like a sine or a cosine curve. So let's make sure we can understand why the acceleration is zero or maximum or minimum at certain spots. Well, if we go back to our velocity versus time graph, Remember that the slope of a velocity versus time graph gives us the value of the acceleration. So if we look at position, well, let's draw some slope lines here. So at, when it goes through position B at that time, the velocity graph has a zero slope, a negative slope when it's at position C, a zero slope at position B, 
and a positive slope at position A. So going back to position B, since the slope is zero, the acceleration has to have a zero value. We can see the acceleration is zero. When it gets to position C, which is going to be up here, the positive maximum displacement, looks like the velocity has a negative slope, and so the acceleration has to be negative. And that's the largest negative slope in that time interval, and so that's going to be the largest negative acceleration that that mass experiences. Going back to position C, so from C down to B, once it passes through position B, the slope of the velocity versus time graph is zero, which means the acceleration has to be zero. Notice that when the mass is passing through the equilibrium position, that's position B, the acceleration is zero. We're going to explain why that is in just a minute. So let's look back at position A. When the object goes all the way down, changes direction, and comes back up, on our velocity versus time graph is a positive slope, and it's the largest positive slope on the graph, and so that's the largest maximum positive acceleration we get right there. See how these things match up. So let's see if we can explain why when the object passes through equilibrium there's no acceleration, when it's at position C it has its largest negative acceleration, and when it's at position A it has its largest positive acceleration. Well remember acceleration depends on the size of the net force that any object experiences at any given time. Acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces over the mass, or the net force over the mass. So let's look at position A, position B, and position C, and think about the forces that that mass experiences when it gets to those positions. So at position A, when the mass is stretched down below its equilibrium position, well remember, what's happening at equilibrium? Let's actually do that first. When a mass is just hanging in equilibrium position before it's been disturbed and oscillates, equilibrium means that the sum of all the forces on it must be zero. The force of gravity pulling down on the mass is equal and opposite in size to the, the size of the spring force pulling up. They're the same size. When the mass is pulled below position B to position A, the force of gravity doesn't change because there's just 50 gram, a 50 gram mass hanger that's oscillating back and forth, so Fg doesn't change. But if the spring is stretched farther, because it's pulled down now to position A, the spring force has to be larger. And so at position A, the sum of the forces on that object has to be positive. The sum of the forces is pointed up. And so at position A, if the sum of the forces is positive, we would expect that the acceleration is also positive. And we see that at position A, it has a positive acceleration. Well, once it gets to position B, we just we already said the forces are the same size, so the sum of the forces on the object, while it's moving through the equilibrium position, is zero. And if the sum of the forces is zero on an object, what has to be true of its acceleration? We know the acceleration also has to be zero. So anytime the object is at the equilibrium position, whether it's at rest or moving through that position, the acceleration at that instant in time has to be zero. And then what about position C? When the mass makes it all the way up to position C, turns around, comes back down, it's moving up and slowing down, and then at that spot it's going to be moving down and speeding up. So the sum of the forces we know has to be negative. If it's moving up and slowing down, sum of the forces has to be negative. If it's moving down and speeding up, again the sum of the forces has to be negative. If we look at the force diagram, again the force of gravity doesn't change in size, the mass stays the same, but when the mass is above the equilibrium position, the spring is stretched less than it was, and so the size of the force the spring exerts on the mass has to be smaller, so when we add up all those forces on the object, the sum of the forces is negative. And if the sum of the forces on that mass is negative, that means the acceleration also has to be negative. On the top I have our velocity graphed as a function of time, and below I have what's true of the kinetic energy of that mass graphed over time. That was a calculated value I found using Logger Pro. We can see that the kinetic energy of the object is zero, 
when the velocity is zero when we would expect that. So anytime the velocity is zero, which means it's gonna be at either the lowest or highest position, uh, position A or position C, we would expect the kinetic energy to be zero. Well, notice the kinetic energy is at maximum at what times? Well, the kinetic energy will be at maximum when it's moving the fastest. And kinetic energy is can't be negative, it's only a positive value. And so when the velocity is at its largest positive value, the kinetic energy will be at maximum. And the kinetic energy will be at maximum when the velocity is at its largest negative value. And so we can see peaks for the kinetic energy anytime there's a positive velo velocity maximum or a negative velocity maximum. And it's going to look like a sine curve similar to what our velocity versus time graph looks like. The last thing we're going to look at in terms of how we can graph something as it changes over time is the total mechanical energy of the system. So thinking about the spring on the left, as we have throughout this whole video, the question is, how does the system's mechanical energy change over time? Remember that the mechanical energy of a system is defined as the sum of the kinetic energy of that system and the total potential energy of that system. Well, if we have a, a vertical spring mass system, uh, it has both gravitational potential energy and spring potential energy. And so what's going on with the total mechanical energy of the system? Well, it kind of depends how we decide to define friction. If we decide that friction is insignificant, it doesn't have a significant effect over time, then there would be no work done on the system, which means we would expect the mechanical energy of the system to stay constant. So the sum of the kinetic energy and the total potential energy of the system has to be a constant value. But in a real spring system, does that actually happen? Does the mechanical energy of the system stay conserved? Does it stay constant? Well, let's find out. So on the left here, I have our same spring mass system that's oscillating, and I'm plotting position versus time and velocity versus time. And I've done it for a much longer time than a few seconds. And so you can see on the time axis, we've done it for almost 100 seconds. And what do you notice after almost 100 seconds or a couple minutes of this thing oscillating back and forth? What has changed about how it's oscillating? Well, you can see in the position versus time graph that it's not moving as far from equilibrium as time goes on. Uh, its amplitude is actually decreasing. And if you look at the velocity, the maximum velocity or speed that the mass reaches is also decreasing over time. So this suggests that the mechanical energy of the system for a real spring mass system actually decreases over time. And how could we explain that? Well, friction has to have some significant effect on our system. This mass, as it's moving through the air, feels a little bit of air resistance or air friction. As the mass moves up, friction pushes down. As the mass moves down, fr friction pushes up. So there's negative work done on the system by friction, and so the mechanical energy decreases over time. So when friction is significant, uh, we know that the mechanical energy of the system decreases over time. Um, and that means amplitude decreases because the maximum spring potential energy is decreasing over time, and the maximum speed also has to decrease because the maximum kinetic energy is decreasing over time. One last thing. So everything we've just been talking about in this video is for a vertical oscillating spring mass system, and we talked about how position, velocity, acceleration, the potential energy of the system and the spring, the kinetic energy of the system all vary kind of like a back and forth, like a sine or cosine curve. Well, that's actually true for horizontal spring mass systems um, and for pendulum systems. The periodic motion of all three of these systems can be described as simple harmonic motion or sometimes just known as SHM. So now you guys should be able to think about how all of these quantities, position, velocity, acceleration, potential energy, and kinetic energy change over time for any one of these three systems.